Hi, welcome to Alicia's Kitchen. <laughs> I'm Cynthia, and for our debut video for Kitchen Magic and Cooking, I um, settled on making Hungarian goulash. And the reason I chose goulash is because it's a big part of my family's history. My grandparents, hey you, my grandparents <laughs> made down. goulash, but they made the American version, and they made it really frequently. Um, I know that butter smells good. <laughs> Do you want me to get him down? I'll get him. Okay. <laughs> um, so my grandparents made American goulash, which is quite different than the original version from Eastern Europe. American goulash is a lot actually like hamburger helper. It's a really affordable comfort food that really most people that eat it, I think are from the Midwest. My grandparents ate it and I, in doing a research around the history of goulash, I, it makes sense that my grandparents, that it would have been a part of their repertoire because our ancestors migrated through Eastern Europe, from Germany, through um, Hungary and Romania, and into the area which is now Ukraine. In the past, it was Russia, but then they settled along the Black Sea. So they would have had exposure to goulash um, through that trip that they made over land. And then also once they were living there. I don't know how much they would have, the Vogel ancestors would have prepared goulash in in their home at the Black Sea. Because from what I understand, Germans from Russia didn't grow and farm a lot of the ingredients needed for goulash. But it became an American dish because of that history. So it's a very simple dish. It's a poor person's dish. And its origins are with the shepherding community in Hungary and also in Romania. So shepherds would be gone for months at a time, tending their flocks out on the steppes and in various parts, you know, from mountainous down to the steppes regions. And so they needed food that was hearty and filling and that was easy to prepare. And goulash was essentially just a red meat, either lamb or beef of some type that was dried and then they would reconstitute it and rehydrate it while they were out and away from home. And so it's a poor person's food. It's um, a rib sticking food. It's meant to be very filling because those jobs were very difficult, very long days, very hard work physically, and they needed a lot of rib sticking nourishing foods like, like this. So this is a very simple stew. And I'm just gonna start now with, um, to cooking in this kitchen. It's my niece Alicia's kitchen. So I'm just gonna start now dehydrate or I mean um sauteing the onions and then all you really need to do Alicia if you want to come in and show some of these ingredients is um it's they're really simple. So it's just beef dredged in some flour tomatoes which I used um fresh tomatoes these are an heirloom variety that I stewed yesterday to be ready. You certainly don't have to use fresh. You can use canned tomatoes, but I wanted to use fresh just because when you make the extra effort, it really pays off. They're delicious to use fresh tomatoes in, in sauces versus canned. Um, and here's my tomatoes. So just kind of waiting for this. And then the first step is to kind of, I should have started this butter already, but the first step is just to kind of saute these onions to get it ready um and then i don't know if you want to pause because i don't have it's going all right so the first step is you just want to get this is a really basic hungarian goulash i'm not making the american version i'll put a link to the american version but it's the american version of goulash is like macaroni noodles and ground beef and canned tomatoes and paprika <laughs> So it's, it's a very simple dish, just slightly different than, than this one. So what you, the starting point really is to saute these onions and butter until they get translucent. The um, recipe that I was going off of called for only two teaspoons of butter, which to me is insane, to saute all these onions plus the rest to make the, help the stew thicken. So I used quite a bit more. But I sometimes like to cook from feel like that. Um, it doesn't always pay off. Sometimes I screw up dishes because I disagree and then realize there was a reason why it only called for two teaspoons. So hopefully that doesn't happen <laughs> this time. But the other interesting thing about this dish, and one of the things I wanted to feature since we're also talking about 
kind of kitchen magic and how to cook with intention and using herbs in a magic in a magical way besides just for flavor. So I, it was inspiring to me to kind of look into the history of paprika and if there's any uses in magic workings for paprika. And I found out a lot of really interesting information that I didn't know before, which is paprika is originally from uh, the capsicum, a variety of peppers from the Americas, from Turtle Island. And the Spanish um, colonizers, when they were over here, the first time around, basically, they took some that went back to Europe, took some of the pepper seeds with them. And those seeds formed the foundation for the peppers to be grown in Europe and to create the use of paprika. So it's not a spicy seasoning. There are some spicier varieties of paprika. This one doesn't happen to be spicy. It's a sweeter variety. Um, Goulash is not a spicy dish, but it's the main ingredient is paprika, so it's sort of the queen of a, the dish of goulash. And when I was looking for kind of magic uses for paprika and the history of that and whether it's really been used, there is not a lot that I could find. I found really limited sources. They were all kind of somebody's personal witchery blog or whatever about paprika, so I don't know how authentic any of the sources even are. But the main uses that I found just through the internet, if I did more time invested in the research, I might find more, is that paprika is used in spell work really to just boost the magic that you're practicing. So if you're making a charm, for example, that includes plants, like a protective charm, you would add paprika to it to boost the protective properties of the plants that you're using in your charm that are already known for protection. Paprika much like what it does in food is that it just enhances the depth and the power of your intentions and your magical sort of workings. So there's not a lot that I could find about its use in magic other than that. But this recipe, like normally Americans or people in the United States use paprika, really the only way I've ever seen it used is like on deviled eggs. People will, we use it more as a garnish here. This recipe calls for two tablespoons of paprika in the stew, which is way more than I've ever used. I'm not somebody that cooks a lot with paprika, so I'm excited to try this and see how it comes out. My grandparents did use paprika in the American version of goulash. It's like the common factor are tomatoes, meat, and paprika, but that's kind of where the commonalities end. They're not very similar dishes otherwise, other than they're affordable they're filling and humble. They're just humble immigrant food, basically, that made its way to the United States and its own weird version. There's, <laughs> there's even a name, like, I've always wondered, for example, like, is chop suey really a, is that really a Chinese dish? It doesn't sound Chinese at all. And I don't know if it is or not. I've never researched it. But one of the names for American goulash is American chop suey because it's just sort of a hodgepodge of ingredients. Um, that's what it became in the United States. Um, but I, they, it's humble origins either way. So what, you're, what we're doing here is we're getting these onions translucent. They're just about there. Um, not you're not caramelizing them but you're getting them close so a lot of the sugars are starting to come out because this is a slow cooking stew so once this is ready it needs to um cook for two hours so that's caraway caraway is the other seasoning in this hungarian goulash recipe and it's in a lot of recipes for goulash caraway seed it's another spice that I don't cook with a ton. I'm not as familiar with it. And then paprika, I'm actually, rather than winging it, I am going to measure out two tablespoons because it's a seasoning. It'll be item. in the same drawer as the um, other oh, kitchen I'm just gonna use, that works. <laughs> yeah, this is what, when we didn't have measuring spoons as a kid, I remember freaking out one time <laughs> and being like, well, how do I measure a teaspoon and a tablespoon? And my dad showed me. You just use your regular spoons, like a soup spoon. That's actually, a, I didn't know that. That's really cool. Yeah, they're a slightly bigger, I think, than the official measured ones. So there's roughly 
I'm not going to add too much more. This is roughly two tablespoons of paprika in there. You can get all kinds of really yummy paprikas. You can get smoked paprika, spicy or fiery, a little more that has a little more heat to it. This is a sweeter paprika, but it's Hungarian paprika. There are three official makers of paprika in Hungary, um, and they use different methods, but they're in the history that I found, they're basically the same people that have been making Hungarian paprika for several centuries. So they have some really interesting methods from harvesting the peppers to smoking them to drying them and how they get pounded into the spice that becomes paprika. It's pretty interesting. And I'll add links to that um, once this is uploaded. So this is going to saute for a little bit longer and then essentially the next step is to um, dredge this beef in uh, flour. And it smells flour, so good already. Does it? Yeah, yeah, I love the smell of paprika. And I, um, when you dredge, this is just cooking basics. A lot of people, this is like second nature to them. But a lot of times, if you don't cook much, you don't know. The reason that you use flour like this and you use butter is to create kind of a thickening method so that the stew doesn't just stay soup. It thickens the sauce. Um, and so this is kind of how you get this from, that wouldn't be just like a beef soup. You use the flour and butter and dredge your pieces of beef like this, um, and it'll help it thicken later. This dish also is very nightshade heavy. I think the only ingredient that is not a nightshade is the beef and the herbs. So it contains um, maybe onions too. I don't know if onions are considered a nightshade. I don't think so. But the tomatoes and the potatoes, because we're going to serve this over mashed potatoes, um, which is one of the traditional methods. Another method is to serve it with spätzle, which is a German egg noodle. Um, or you can just make it the stew on its own and add potatoes and carrots. Um, that's not as traditional, which is why I'm not doing it that way. I'm, I'm kind of doing a traditional Hungarian goulash, so I'm not adding potatoes and carrots to the stew. I'm going to serve the stew over mashed potatoes. So again, the, the nice thing about this dish is that it's filling. It's a really good comfort food. It's very affordable. Stew meat is cheap meat. Um, and I just want to let this saute a little bit more. I ordered these groceries and the person that delivered them to me, I discovered too late that I didn't get quite enough stew meat, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have gotten that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, I didn't bring an apron. I should have brought an apron. So just cooking this a little bit. Um... I have a really beautiful cast iron Dutch oven that I would love to make this in, but it's not uh, enameled. And so the tomatoes in this dish will eat away all of my seasoning on my Dutch oven, my cast iron Dutch oven. So I'm using just this regular pot. But you could make a really delicious Hungarian goulash in a Dutch oven. If you had one of those kind of rich person's Dutch oven, the La Crusette or whatever <laughs> ones that are coated with enamel and all that, those are really nice. Um, mine's an antique, the one that I have, but it's got some limits to what kind of stuff I can make in it because of that. So the next step is to um, start adding the beef stock. I'll do slowly.
let this start the flavors blending and let it start thickening. I don't know what you call it if it's part of a stew, but that butter flour combo is called making a roux. I don't know exactly if that's what you would call it in this case because I'm doing it as part of a stew. I don't know what it's called. Maybe the same thing. I just don't know enough about official cooking terminology. So let this cook down together. And then you could totally use what the recipe I went with called for was one can um, maybe one of the larger cans of diced tomatoes. Um, so what I did was get three large heirloom tomatoes and then stewed them down, figuring that was going to be a fairly close approximation for a can of diced tomatoes that have already been cooked down. So I'm going to go ahead and add these tomatoes now. These are three large heirloom tomatoes that I stewed and kind of just mashed up with my hands. I see there's still some kind of thicker chunks of it in here, but that's okay. The, the green heirloom that's in here wasn't as ripe as I would have liked, but I went with it because you got to work with what you got to work with. So essentially, the only other thing that you really need to do now with this stew is bring it back to a boil. Cover it and let it slow cook on a lower temperature because tough meat, like stew meat, if you don't know a lot about cooking, and I'm trying to speak to a large group from anyone who knows a lot about cooking to people who are still kind of new to it. So um, stew meat and tougher cuts of beef do really well slow cooked like this. They're not as great for trying to just cook up a quick steak or whatever, but to do a tougher cuts of meat, are, are more humble. They're way more affordable. So if you're a meat eater, I highly recommend learning to cook slow cook meats like that, either braised um, in a pot with some greens or whatever, however you want to do it. It's so good. It just takes time. You need more time to cook. So you maybe do it on a weekend and then freeze half of it for your week later. But um, this is really pretty much set to go. I just need to add a little bit of salt and pepper. It's already got its paprika and caraway. Um, I just have to now return it to a boil and then we're going to cook this down for like two hours and then we'll serve it over some mashed gold potatoes um, and, and we'll have ourselves a hearty Hungarian goulash early dinner I guess. So thank you.